So this lecture is part of an online commutative algebra course and will be about the spectrum of a ring. So in the last couple of lectures, we covered two obvious ways of drawing pictures of a ring, either by drawing a point for each element or a point for each basis element. The spectrum of a ring is one where you draw a point for each prime ideal. So the first two methods sort of work quite well in a few simple cases, but for most rings, they just don't work very well. I mean, most rings, it's not very practical to draw every element of the ring. And most rings are not vector spaces over fields, so you can't draw a basis for it. But the drawing a point for each prime ideal works quite well for all rings. Um, I'll start with some motivation. So suppose X is a compact Hausdorff space. Then I'm going to take R to be the ring of continuous functions on X under pointwise multiplication, of course. And the idea is that X is a good picture of the ring R. So um, what we do is we draw a picture of X and think of the ring R as being the ring of continuous functions on that space. And that's sort of the idea of, of um, defining the um, spectrum of a ring. So the ring R in this case is something called a commutative um, C star algebra. So the theory of C star algebras was developed um, some time before Groth and Dick invented schemes and was probably rather influential on, on the definition of a scheme, although it's the early history is a little bit unclear. So a C star algebra basically means it's an algebra over the real numbers, and it has a norm where the norm of a function is just the supremum over all x in the space x of the absolute value of f of x. So there's a whole theory of algebras with a norm that we're not going to worry about too much because that's mainly of interest to analysts. But anyway, um, the point is that the um, space x can be recovered from the ring r. So we can go from x to r by taking a ring of continuous functions. We can also go back from r to x. So suppose we're given r, um, we can reconstruct x as follows. The points of x correspond to the maximal closed ideals of R. And the way this works as follows, um, point X just corresponds to the ideal of points. So the ideal of, sorry, the ideal of functions with F of X equals zero. So it's just the functions vanishing at X. Um, and it follows easily from the stone weierstrass theorem. Weierstrass seems to be turning up rather often in this course for completely different reasons. So the stone weierstrass theorem describes the um, conditions under which a closed subalgebra is equal to the whole ring. And from this, it's easy to follow that all closed maximal ideals of R are of this form. So we can reconstruct the points of the space X. We can also reconstruct the topology on X. We can reconstruct the topology in two ways. We can either say a basis of open sets is given by the functions DF um, so I guess I better use the notation that Eisenberg is using. Uf is informally the points where f is not zero. Well, what do we mean by f being zero at a point of x? Well, this is just the points m with f um, not in M. So you remember the points are really prime ideals of the ring R. So we can just look at the 
points where f is non-zero. And these form a basis for the open sets. Um, alternatively, we, we can take any closed ideal and we can form from it the set of maximal ideals containing I, which is a closed set of the space X. You can think of it as being the common zeros of all elements of the ideal I. So there are two ways of describing the topology and we're going to use these two ways later on for arbitrary ideals. Um, by the way, different closed ideals can give rise to the same closed set of X. So we don't get a one-to-one -one correspondence between closed sets and ideals. And the idea is to, we can copy this for any commutative ring. R. We just take a set X to be the maximal ideals of the ring R and define the topology as above in either of the two ways. Well, that gives you something called um, um, the maximal spectrum of R, sometimes denoted by spec M of R. And it sort of works, but not very well. There's a problem with it, as I will explain. So if you're looking at C star algebras, if you've got any two C star algebras, um, R and S, and you've got a map from R to S, then you get a map from the maximal spectrum of S back to the maximal spectrum of R. Um, let's call that X. Um, and this is this can be defined as follows. If M is a maximal ideal of S, then you can just look at F to the minus one M as being a point of R. Well, there's a bit of a problem if you try doing this for arbitrary rings. The problem is that F to the minus one of a maximal ideal might not be a maximal ideal. For example, if f is the map from the integers to the rational numbers, and you take m to be the maximal ideal zero, then f to the minus one m is again the ideal zero, which is no longer maximal in z. So if we work with maximal ideals, we can't really get a map between spaces whenever we've got a map between rings. And it's really convenient that homomorphisms between rings ought to correspond in some way to um, continuous maps between the corresponding spectra. So um, this isn't too difficult to fix um, if we just think about what the problem is. So let's, let, let's analyze what the problem is. So if you've got a map from rings R to S, you remember a maximal ring of I S corresponds to a map from S onto a field. So a maximal ideal is a field. That's more or less the definition of a maximal ideal of a ring. It's one such that the quotient is a field. And now we obtain a map from R to K, but the image of R might not be the whole of K. So it's a subring of K. So it is an integral domain but need not be a field. So um, if this map here is F and the maximal ideal here was M, then R over F to the minus one S is a sub ring of K. So it's an integral domain. Um, so we can at least say that this is a prime ideal of R. You remember uh, an, an ideal is prime corresponds to saying that R over P is an integral domain. Equivalently, this means that if X, Y is in P, this implies X is in P 
or y is in p, which is an alternative form of this definition. You see, that's just saying x, y is zero in the quotient, and that means either x is zero or y is zero. Now, fit the, the, the problem we ran into here is that a subring of a field is not a field, but a subring of an integral domain is an integral domain. So a subring of an integral domain is an integral domain. And so if F is a homomorphism of rings from R to S and M is a prime ideal in S, uh, that way around, so F to the minus one of a prime ideal is prime. So this suggests that we shouldn't work with maximal ideals, but we should work with prime ideals. So now we define the spectrum of R as follows. So the points just correspond to prime ideals of the ring R. And the topology is defined in either of the two ways above. We can either choose a basis of open sets given by U of F, which is the set of prime ideals such that F is not in um, P. You can think of this informally as being the points where F is non-zero, although that's not really quite true. Or we can think for, for any ideal Z, we can look at the, the set of the closed sets are of the form Z of I, which are the set of prime ideals such that I is contained in, in, in the ideal P. So these are two equivalent ways of defining the topology. Um, so um, it might be an idea just to check that this really does give a topology. So check that the Z of I form a topology. So these form the closed sets of a topology, not the open sets of a topology. So we've got to check that it's closed under unions, and that follows easily um, because, sorry, not unions, intersections. We've got to show that it's closed under arbitrary intersections because the intersection of all the ideals Z of alpha is just the Z corresponding to the ideal generated by all the Z of all the I alpha. is fairly trivial. Checking that the union of two of these sets is still one of these sets is a little bit trickier. It's actually to equal to zij, where this is generated by all products ij for i in i and j in j. It's the usual product of two ideals. And now it's not quite obvious that a prime ideal containing one of these two is the same as the prime ideals containing this. And for this, you, you need to use the fact that if P is a prime ideal, then IJ is contained in P if and only if I is contained in P or J is contained in P. So leave this as an exercise. Um, so these, these sets really do form the topology of on, on, on a space. And now we should give a few examples of the spectrum of space. Let's start with some trivial examples. So first of all, if R is the zero ring with no non-zero elements, so one is equal to zero, the spectrum of R is the empty set. And you actually need to think about this for a few seconds because you have to try and wonder whether or not zero is a prime ideal. And zero is not a prime ideal because part of the definition of integral domain must, it must have one is not equal to zero. Um, 
that's not something you can argue about. It's just part of the definition. It's not something you can figure out by thinking deeply about it. Um, so the next example is let's take R to be a field. Well, here there's only one prime ideal. So the spectrum of R is just the ideal zero. Um, and this is just a point. So this sort of shows, corresponds to the fact that fields are the easiest sorts of commutative rings. Their spectra are particularly easy. They're just points. So now let's look at a polynomial ring. Let's take R to be the ring of polynomials over the complex numbers. So what are the prime ideals of this? Well, this is a this is a principal ideal domain, so all ideals are principal. It's really easy to work out the prime ideals. There are two sorts of prime ideals. First of all, there are the maximal ones, which are the form x minus alpha, for alpha a complex number. And there's non-maximal one. Well, there's just the ideal zero. So the spectrum of R is just the complex numbers union infinity. Well, it's not quite, because we should think about what the topology is. We shouldn't really think of this as being a point at infinity. It's more like um, a, a sort of generic point. I mean, when you think of a space as being having a point for each complex number plus an extra point, you sort of automatically think, well, it's something like the Riemann sphere. It's just the complex numbers with a point at infinity. And this is just wrong. Um, the topology is quite unlike the Riemann sphere, and this doesn't behave like a point at infinity at all. So um, let's first of all look at the topology on the maximal um, um, spectrum. So, so, so the spec M of R looks like C if you ignore the topology, but the topology is a bit weird. So the closed sets are C, and all finite sets. Remember, if you've got an ideal, it's just generated by some polynomial f, which is x minus alpha 1, x minus alpha 2, and so on, x minus alpha n. So the only prime ideals, maximal ideals containing it, are the prime ideals are the ideals corresponding to the complex numbers alpha 1, alpha 2, up to alpha n. In particular, this topology is not Hausdorff. Um, all open, all non-empty open sets are dense. I suppose I should say the topology are the, are the I mean, yes, I do remember to say that. Um, if you add the extra point, things get even weirder because the point zero is not closed in this topology. In fact, its closure is the whole space spec of, of, of R. So the maximal spectrum is bad enough. It's non hausdorff but at least the individual points are closed. Once you start adding this point as well, the topology gets even weirder. This makes it rather difficult to draw. I mean, you can try and draw the complex numbers um, as um, you, you, you can draw a picture of them as being the usual Euclidean plane, except you've got to remember that you don't have the usual topology on the Euclidean plane. The closed sets are just finite sets. But when you try and draw this extra point, the um, best you can do is you can draw it as a sort of fuzzy generic point. Um, so this is a sort of fuzzy generic point that is everywhere dense. So it's a sort of, it may be a single point, but it's a really big point because its closure contains the whole space. Um, and this is the main problem about drawing rings as a spectra. It's really hard to draw them in Euclidean space. You have to remember the topology is much weirder than Euclidean space topology, but um, you'll get used to it after a while. So now let's try and do the spectrum of Z. Um, again, um, we have the maximal ideals. Well, the maximal ideals are just two, three, five, 
seven and so on, just corresponding to primes. And we should also get an extra prime ideal, zero. Again, z is a, z is a principal ideal domain, so it's easy to find all these ideals. And what you notice is that terminology has got messed up. The prime ideals don't quite correspond to primes. They correspond to primes together with the ideal zero. And there's nothing you can do about this. You just have to accept that prime ideals don't quite correspond to primes. Um, so how do we draw a picture of this? Well, the closed sets are, again, easy to work out because they just correspond to ideals of z which you know so they're finite subsets of two three five and so on and you notice that naught is not in the set so you can have finite subsets of these things without naught and the whole space so we've again got this problem that these sets here these points here are closed points, but this point of the space is not a closed set. And again, it's rather hard to draw this space. What you can do is you can think of the prime ideal zero as being a big one-dimensional point. And yes, I know points can't be one-dimensional. That's just too bad. I'm going to call this a one-dimensional point because it sort of behaves as if it were one-dimensional. And embedded in this huge one-dimensional point are these zero-dimensional points correspond to the prime ideals 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and so on. So this is the best we can do trying to draw this space in Euclidean space. As, as I, I just repeat that there is no good way to draw a picture of this in Euclidean space because any subset of Euclidean space is Hausdorff. And this space is very far from being Hausdorff, so we just have to fake it like this. Um, then we can look at the spectrum of R of X. Let's take polynomials over the reals. Now, you might think if the spectrum of complex polynomials is complex numbers union this generic point, then maybe the same is true of the spectrum of the reals. Maybe we just get the real numbers together with an extra point. Well, that's not what happens. We do indeed get a copy of the reals corresponding to the maximal ideals x minus alpha for alpha in the reals. And we also get a non-maximal ideal zero. And this is, as usual, not, not closed. But we also get some extra maximal ideals because there are some irreducible polynomials of degree greater than one. So we get all polynomials with two complex roots. So b squared minus 4ac is less than zero. So this has two roots, x plus or minus iy with y not equal zero. So you see the point the, 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 the spec points of the spectrum correspond to the generic point naught plus um, um, sets consisting of x plus i y x minus i y for complex numbers x and y. So if y is zero, this just gives us the real point. And if y is non-zero, we get a pair of complex points. So the spectrum is equal to the generic point union the complex numbers folded in half in some sense. We sort of can't, we, we, we identify each complex number with its complex conjugate. Um, so uh, in, in general, for fields, a similar thing happens. If you, if you try and form the spectrum of k of x, the points correspond to orbits of the Galois group of the algebraic closure on the algebraic closure of k, uh, together with the point 0. So the spectrum of a non-algebraically closed field is a little bit more complicated than you might expect. You, you also need to know what all algebraic extensions of the field look like. Okay, so next lecture I'll be giving more examples of 
the spectrum of uh, of rings. 